today we're going to do something different. I recently came across a bunch of comments in a conversation between atheists and Christians about why these atheists became atheists why they decided to leave Christianity and stop following Jesus. I actually think that it's valuable to look at this, to test their reasonings, to think it through for when we are confronted with these questions. And also, sometimes those who we consider our opponents may have real valid things that they can bring up that we can actually learn from. Are there anything that they said as a reason for why they left that's actually rightfully the fault of Christianity? Let's look at this and let's see. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is one regarding sin doesn't exist, so I don't need salvation. It seems that a lot of people start falling away from Yeshua, from Jesus, when they start thinking that they don't need to be saved because there's nothing for them to be saved from. Right. You may see this as a pattern. Let's look at the first one. He says, once you realize that God is not real, then by proxy, salvation is too. you know, it's like saying to a snake oil salesman that you don't need a medication for his made up sickness. I rejected the idea that we need salvation in the first place. The idea of needing blood sacrifices to appease God's wrath is extremely primitive. I don't worship a blood God, nor a being as petty and psychotic as the one shown in the Old Testament. All right, so let's break this up. I think there's two things that's brought up here. First is this discussion of the made up sickness, right? This idea that that there's this there's actually nothing that I need to be saved from. Now, I think what's very important for us to understand, first of all, is that what do we mean when we say there is no sickness? Look, you don't need to believe in a God to look around you and to recognize that there is something huge that's wrong in this world, that there is a sickness that permeates humanity. The fact that we do evil, that humanity is full of greed, lying, deceits, hatreds, I mean, just turn on the news. We don't have to look far to find the sickness. In fact, you don't even have to believe in the Bible to recognize that it is wrong and evil because as a society inside of our hearts, we know that there is evil in the world. Right. This is why when we had World War II end, a lot of the Nazi leaders and death camp guards were put on death's row. What gave us the right to do that? It's because we recognized that there was real evil that was being done by these men. And this means that death is sometimes resorted to for the extinguishing of evil or in the least true justice is something that we look to the punishment of those who do evil. That's why we put them in prisons so that there can be some form of relief towards the victims, families and the victims themselves. The fact of the matter is we are sick as people. There is a sickness and you don't need to believe in what the Bible defines sickness as to identify that there is a form of sickness. Now that now that we have that that out of the way, I think this second part of the question regarding the need for quote unquote blood sacrifices. All right. I think what's very important is for us to recognize something about the sacrifices in the Torah or in the Old Testament. You know, when we let's just be honest, right? It's weird. OK, like I give credit to this man who said that, well, look, these it's weird. It's strange. It's, you know, he uses stronger language than I would, but I understand where he's coming from. I want to read to you Hebrews 10 4. it says it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. OK, so he's saying that in the in the word, the Bible, it says 
bulls and goats and their blood cannot cleanse people from sins. That is not ever hap- that's never happened and is not used. That's not what it's used for. Now that's the question is, well, what are these sacrifices for? It's to teach you the severity of your sin, the fact that something needs to die, that there is a consequence to the fact that you lie, that you steal, that you lust after women, that you do things that are uh, evil, right? So you're, you're, be, you're being shown the consequence and the fact that these, these sins have caused you to be separated from God. Why? Because God is perfect. He is holy. He's so perfect and holy that no sin can come in his presence. So, yes, blood sacrifices of animals, it's ugly. It's unpleasant. It's horrible. It's it deals with death. But that's the point, because it's all a picture of what you've done. Your sin is horrible. It's ugly. It's disgusting. And so if you want to look at animal sacrifices with disgust, that's the point. Because that's what God wants you to look at yourself with when you need to look upon your own sin. The point, the fact that there is something wrong, that there is a sickness that we need a cure for. Like that's the point of it. So to point at the blood sacrifice and say, ew, that's gross. It's weird. I, want, I don't want to serve a God behind that. God is not behind that. You are. You see, if it was never, if we never fell, if we never sinned, if we, if we are actually innocent, none of that would have needed to be demonstrated to us for us to look in the mirror and see what we've actually done. You see, all of our sins, this is, this all points to how all of our sins were placed on Jesus, on Yeshua, and he received the punishment that we deserve, the death that we deserved. He received so that he can die in your place. Take the punishment so that you can stand before God clean. So someone jumping in front of a bullet for you is not primitive. That is salvation. And his name is Jesus. Right. Let's look at the next question. Okay, this next one is regarding lies from spiritual leaders. This ought to be good. He says, my parents and local religious leaders kept making more and more outlandish claims, many of which I could actually fact check and found to be false. So I just kept on fact checking and much of it was either not demonstrable true or downright demonstrably false. I could not believe it anymore. There's some good and good stuff in here. Look, first off, who's fact checking like if you're fact checking information by your church leaders by your parents or anyone okay that's good we need to do research and we need to be ambassadors of truth jesus was an ambassador of truth and so pastors and parents who say they follow jesus they need to be ambassadors of truth because their witness indeed is on the line but now when you go and test what they are telling you, where do you go to test? Well, what information do you compare it to? Do you simply go to people who do not believe in God to hear about what they have to say about the things spoken of by people who do believe in God? Because if you go to someone who doesn't believe in God, they're going to have a certain bias, of course. And that doesn't mean that you cannot evaluate what they have to say. But you do need to also go actually deeply and look at what people who do believe in God have to say. Scientists who do believe in God, archaeologists who do believe in God, doctors who do believe in God, whatever field who do believe in God to get the other side of the story so you can actually weigh these opinions and weigh the research to find what is truth. Secondly, I want to say something to the credit of this atheist. And that is that there are indeed many pastors and believers who share information that is not true. 
who hear something, they read something on the internet and they share it because it's in the internet, right? So it must be true. No, that's not how this works, right? We have to be people who are hungry for the truth. So when I see an article posted on Facebook that is like kind of like, wow, I'm not going to believe it until I test it, until there are witnesses, until there is research that is peer reviewed. Peer reviewed research means it's research that has witnesses that have come to say we have looked at this research and we have been able to replicate it. We have seen that it is actually true and we can testify you that this is actually true. If we don't do this, if we just believe everything we hear, brothers and sisters, dear pastors, dear believing parents, dear believers, if we just believe whatever we hear, we hurt our credibility. And in that matter, if we get it wrong, and, and someone figures out it's wrong, they may start thinking that everything we say is wrong, even the witness of our Messiah. And you see how dangerous that becomes so quickly. We need to be a people known for being authentic, real and credible about what we share and say. I'm very careful. Let me say this. I am very careful about repeating information. Very careful. If I hear something on the news, if I see I'm careful about sharing it as truth until I'm and until I know to the best of my ability, at least I know this is hard, but you need to do what you can to the best of your ability to make sure what you share is true because you are a represent representative of the Messiah, of Yeshua, of Jesus, of Christianity. And who knows, maybe this atheist left because of the truth and he couldn't handle the truth and he wanted to believe a lie instead, maybe. But what if he left because he actually heard a lie told by Christians? That is would not be the first time that has happened. Uh, we, we, we need to not only be, let me say it like this, concerned with what we share. We need to be concerned with whom we share what. Even Paul said, when you speak in tongues, be careful that you don't just do so without interpretation in the midst of unbelievers, because they're going to say you're out of your mind. So he's literally saying that watch out what you speak, because even if you speak in tongues and what if and even if it's true, even if it's real, if you cause someone to stumble because they're not ready for it, because they've never heard it before, never seen it before, they're brand new at all this, and this would be weird for them. Don't share it with them like that until, unless there's someone who could actually explain what's going on. Otherwise, they're going to be more confused and think you're crazy. And so in the same way, when we're going to share information, don't share information that's not relevant to them with them. If they're not ready for it, if they're not mature enough for it, if they can't handle it, they're going to think you're crazy, but you should have actually just rather shared the simplicity of the gospel so they can first come to belief and repentance. And then you can they can come along and you can you can start sharing the deeper things, the, the more complicated and, and things that really, you know, you need to really sit down with someone for them to believe and understand the way you intend. So let, let, let them see the depravity of of themselves without Christ first, and then we go for the rest. In the scriptures, we see that the disciples and Yeshua, they're always about the gospel, the coming kingdom. These basic things they're always sharing because they want people to come in and then they will hear the deeper teachings. Read Acts 15 and you'll see another example of that where they tell people, hey, go and do these few things and they will hear the rest in the synagogues when they hear the law being read. Right. Uh, let's look at further. He goes on and he says, if the people closest to you and your leaders make claims that you find are untrue, why should you believe the same or closely similar claims by people you don't know who loved centuries ago. If you wouldn't believe someone who claimed they saw a UFO last week, why believe an account from someone in the first century that they saw one? Same for ghosts, demons or gods. We know today people make false claims. And we also know people make false claims in error. 
Today, with all of our education, tools, knowledge, why would it be different in the past? Okay, so basically this atheist is saying that with, when we are hearing the testimony of witnesses of 2,000 years ago, you know, why would, should we believe what they have to say if there are people even today who give testimony to things and we don't believe them? You know, people who say, well, you know, I saw this or I saw that and, and we, we discard what they have to say. Basically, the atheist is here claiming that witnesses aren't enough to determine what is true. Okay, but here's the thing. In, in terms of historical evidence, the testimony of witnesses has and continues to be sufficient evidence. Okay, May, historians right, are read today, people who wrote writings of 2000 years ago are read today by scientists and they are believed because they are considered a credible witness. See, just because there's a witness, a testimony that is old doesn't mean it's not sufficient evidence. The question is, is, is that witness credible? And how do we establish that credibility? We look at the motives behind those witnesses. We look at um, whether those testimonies are verifiable. So we have to, when we look at the testimonies of people in the Bible, for example, or, or people like Josephus, who's a, a historian of, the, of that early church period, we have to look at their motives. And now if, if we look at them, we, we, we have to look at someone like Paul the Apostle who, who had a radical encounter, who was a, uh, someone who was a murderer against Christ, who persecuted the disciples of Christianity, of, of Jesus. And suddenly he has in one day a 180 turnaround because he claimed that he saw Jesus raised from the dead and he completely went against everything he previously believed. That's he was a we know he was a intellectual man. We know he was a man that was highly learned under Gamaliel, one of the most highly learned rabbis of the day. And so for him to for Paul to make this big transition is pretty radical. And this radical conversion, even for him to suffer for him for it, to not gain but only to lose influence and to only gain persecutions and imprisonments and so forth means that he not only believed and repeated what he had to repeat because of what he had to gain from it, because of riches or wealth or whatever. No, he did it despite the fact that he was going to lose everything. All right, that's a huge deal because if people lie, they do so for nefarious purposes. They do so to gain something from it. But there was nothing in this world for Paul, for example, to gain. That means that there's credibility in his witness. Paul is not the only one this happened to. The rest of the disciples suffered for what they believed. They did not have a good ride. They did not have uh, notoriety for it. They suffered. Many of them died unto death for the fact that they say, I saw Jesus raised from the dead. Not just I heard someone say that, but I saw to my own eyes and they were willing to be killed for that testimony, to be crucified even for that testimony under Rome. So we see these motives when analyzed, when put under scrutiny, are pure. And that's how uh, historical evidence by witnesses are analyzed. I encourage you to look at our video, Why Jesus Instead of Other Religions, for more of the analyzing of witnesses in the first century. So to say that, oh, I can't believe in Jesus because it's not enough to believe in witnesses, well, that's unscientific because it is uh, uh, the, the historical witnesses that are credible is very scientific. In fact, today in law, the legal system is upheld by the evidence of witnesses. We in our courtrooms take the evidence of witnesses very seriously and we send people to prison when they have been accused 
by various credible witnesses. So that is legal. That is scientific. So to just come to the story of Jesus and say, well, we can't do that, that would not be scientific nor legal to do. Right, let's look at the next atheist and his reasonings. Jesus, a myth. He says, I realized there was no good evidence to support the historicity of the Jesus myth. Moreover, it has all the markings of a legend or a myth. There was no more evidence for Jesus and even less than for other things I didn't believe like Mormonism, Islam or aliens at Roswell. He goes on to say, I, to put it another way, I was struck by what I later learned was the argument from divine hiddenness. I sincerely asked God for relationship and I was left wanting. I was confounded by the lack of modern day miracles and messages from God. Why does God not talk to everyone? Why do only a few get a Damascus Road experience or a burning bush? I realized that if God was loving, powerful, and wanted me to believe, he would reach out. He has not. Therefore, he does not exist. All right. Also, a bunch of different points and questions really in there. And uh, let's break it down. First off, let's just talk about the whole idea of Jesus being a myth or a legend. Right. So virtually all um, scholars of antiquity do, are convinced that Jesus did exist even if many of them are not convinced about the claims that Jesus made about himself. The fact that Jesus was a person who lived in the first century is confirmed. We see secular uh, um, historians uh, confirm this, as well as historians who were not pro the Christian movement confirm that Jesus existed. Now, if you're not for what Jesus stood for, you, you don't have a motive. You don't have a, a horse in the game, if you will, to for that religion. So therefore, you, why would you lie about the fact that Jesus existed if he didn't? Okay, we see, for example, jo Flavius Josephus. Josephus twice men mentions Jesus in his writing Jewish Antiquities, and he was witnessing all of this around the early church period. We have another example, Roman historian Tacitus. We, we see Erman Wright, just about everything he says coincides from a completely different point of view by a Roman author, disdainful of Christians and their superstition. With what the New Testament itself says, Jesus was executed by the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, for crimes against the state and a religious movement of his followers sprang up in his wake. Okay, Tacitus, a Roman historian who is, who is anti-Christian, if you will, confirms that Jesus did was killed at the stake under Pontius Pilate. All right, so... In regards to Jesus being a myth, if we want to be just at least honest with the facts of history, that is that that would be a claim that is just not uh, any that that doesn't have any backing behind it these days anymore. But now to take it further, right? He makes other points that are good. This atheist he goes on and he says regarding he speaks regarding how God didn't show up when he knocked, right? Like that he's saying that, why didn't God show up with me? I asked, I knocked, I wanted to believe that he would reach out to me, but he never did. Therefore, God, God does not exist. Okay, so here's what, what we have to understand. The Bible says that when we knock, the door will be open to us. Okay, it does state that. And that's kind of what this atheist, I think, is alluding to. But here's the thing with that. When Jesus actually recounts that story in Luke 11, he actually makes a specific point about it. He tells us about a story of a man who goes to his neighbor and knocks on the door. And he and the whole point of the story was this man knocks persistently. He does not leave the door until the door is opened. 
And that the neighbor, at the end of the day, opens the door because this man was getting, was knocking to the point of irritation. He was so sure that his friend would open his door that he was not going to leave until he did. And the other thing is, is when we knock on that door of the Father of God, do we knock understanding our own depravity? Do we knock seeking his salvation? Do we knock humbling ourselves, seeking him humbly? Or do we knock saying, well, let's see if he's there. Do we knock saying, well, let's test it out. See if this God really say, is who he says he is. What is our heart's motive and intent behind that knock? Because it has to be honest. It has to be hungry for God. And it has to be a heart of humility. And it has to be a knock that is a knock that is persistent. Furthermore, he will open the door if we do so with the right heart, but sometimes not in the way we would expect. You know, I remember once I spoke to someone and they told me, you know, why did God not warn me about this event that was that was about to happen in my life? Why did why did God not warn me about this man that I was starting to meet and see and, you know, date and things like that. This man who would later ruin my life. Why didn't God warn me? And I remember saying, well, what do you mean? He did warn you. He sent all of these believers to you, warning you about this man that you're dating right now, that, he, that, that he's not going to be good for you. See, brother and sister, sometimes God comes and shows up and proves himself to us in the way that we didn't expect. And we have to be willing to open our heart to that. But God will will come and show himself in a way to you. That all being said, he will do it in a way that you can know that he is real, that he exists, that he loves you. He will fulfill your standard. He will show up in a, to a point, to a standard that would satisfy your confusion, your your uncertainty. It may just not be in the exact way that you'd expect, because sometimes what you want is not what you need. And now the last point that this atheist brought up is the lack of miracles. Why is the lack of modern day miracles and messages from God? Now, let me speak on this. I am with the atheist on this point. Where is the miracles? of these Christians when they say they, they worship this God of miracles? Where's the messages from God like we read in the Bible? If these Christians, they say they worship God, why, why isn't the messages from God coming through them? He, he's bringing up an excellent point. And I, I am, I don't know, if he's watching this, I would tell him, man, you know what? I am sorry that you've been in circles of Christians where you never saw miracles. I'm sorry that you were around Christians who was never able to give you the words, the messages from God's heart. I would repent to him for that because that is a failure of the circle of Christians he was in. See, God has called us to be a people that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I, I have seen it. In the circles I've been in, I have seen him cast out devils. I have seen him heal the sick instantly. I have seen him deliver words of prophecy about people regarding things that they would never have been able to know that would happen in their future. I have myself been a recipient of such words where someone came to me at a young age and said, uh, I, as a prophet from God, came to me and said, you will do this, this, this and this in your life. And that would only happen eight years or so in my future to the T. See, these things do happen, but you need to be among Christians who are spirit filled. Otherwise, you won't see it because these things are by faith. You need to actually be around Christians who believe what they say they believe, not just study it. And so any dear atheist who's watching this, please, if this has been you, seek out a congregation, a place 
where the Holy Spirit is welcomed and His power and His movings, His miracles are welcomed. Because unfortunately, in many churches around America, especially and in the West, especially, they're not as welcomed. Let's look at the next one. Christians are bad moral examples. This atheist says something that I think maybe we can learn something from. He says, since we are constantly told that people should be able to know God exists by looking at Christians and seeing them be different from, quote unquote, the world, it makes sense that people looking at Christians and seeing them being sometimes really awful could be considered evidence that God does not exist. First off, I would formally apologize to this atheist and every other atheist, and I know there are many of them, who have suffered um, awful behavior and character from Christians, who have suffered bad fruit from Christians, who have suffered hatred from Christians. That, there, that is despicable. That is disgusting. And when believers misrepresent what they say they stand for, I can't imagine what a vomit that is in the mouth of our God. Because he in the Bible, God said that he's going to be vomiting out many people who say they believe in him because they have lawlessness, because they do not actually live out the life, live out the identity that they proclaim. So, dear atheist, please understand that God is going to be judging the Christians you speak of if your testimony of them is true. But here's the thing. Let's just make a little example, a little analogy here. If you had a really bad experience with a police officer once, he pulled you over and he wrote you a ticket and it was illicit, it wasn't, it wasn't fair. And, and you know, and this police officer, he was so uh, rude to you and, and, you know, it was just an awful experience. And, and now, years later, you meet another police officer. Are you going to immediately this, see this new police officer in light of how the other one treated you? Are you going to start, uh, uh, you know, considering his actions as the same? No, because you recognize that this is a new person. This is someone else, even though they're, even though they're part of the same organization, if you will, the same police force. This is a new person and I'm going to give him the chance to show who he is by his own actions and how he treats me, not based off how someone else has treated me. See, claiming to be someone doesn't make you something. So just because people have claimed to be Christians doesn't mean that they are Christians, especially when they don't act like it. Uh, 1 John 2 verse 6 says, whoever says he abides in him, in Jesus, or to walk as he walked. So it would make no sense to judge Jesus and who Jesus is and what Jesus stood for based off someone who says they follow Jesus, but act nothing like him. Look at the life of Jesus. Look at what Yeshua did. Look at what he stood for and what he taught and make a determination of who he is based off that. And there are people who follow him who are good mirrors of who he is. But there's also a ton of people who aren't. So let's be fair at how we judge others, especially how we judge Jesus, because that's the most important judgment that you would ever make in your life. Okay, he goes on and he talks about he questions a million years of punishment for 80 years of sin. Having spent my whole life as a Christian, I still struggle with letting the belief go. OK, this idea this is a valid question. This idea that that, you, you know, I can have uh, 80 years of sin, a lifetime of sin, and, and then I can be punished forever for that. That doesn't make any sense. This idea that God is a good God, but he would allow that. How could he be good? OK, so here's what we have to think about. When we stand before a judge for a crime we committed. 
in one day, you know, let's just say someone was murdered, a crime was committed one day, at a certain hour of that day, we stand before a judge and that judge sent us to prison for life for it. See, that judge, what he has done is he has rendered us to be judged for the rest of our life, for the next 80 years, say, because of a murder that happened on one day at one hour. See, this is how justice works. Just because you you did it for one day or one minute or one second has got no bearing on how severe the judgment is. The question is, is what did you do and how severe is what you did? And this is why this punishment feels so long for this atheist. Because, see, what we tend to do is we see, let me say, our standard of of holiness, of perfection, of being a good person, quote unquote, is so much lower than what God's is. See, God is so perfect. His standard, he is holy, he is set apart. He is the name above names. And this is he is so high and holy and perfect that that any dirt, any evil is so, so beneath him. You see that his standard is so high that any evil is sent out of his presence forever. Because, you see, it's only because our standard is so low. We say, well, how can I be punished forever if I, for, if I just did 80 years of evil? Let me say this. One minute of evil is enough to punish you forever. Because evil is evil. E- evil, you, you break one law and you have broken them all because you are nonetheless not like God. You are nonetheless evil. You see, what determines whether we are evil or good, there is only there's two sides of this. It's black and white. You are either a good person. You have never done anything wrong. You have never sinned. You have never lied, stolen. You've never looked at a woman the way you shouldn't have. You have never done anything wrong. That is what a good person is. And an evil person is someone who one day goes and gossips. An evil person is someone who one day goes and lies. That person is evil. That, that man standing before a judge, the judge will render him a evil man who needs to be judged for what he did. And so because God's standard is higher than ours, we question his punishment. But if our standard was in line with his, we would see the, the punishment suits the crime perfectly. And that's what needs to put a fear needs to be putting a fear in all of our hearts, because all of us are guilty of a crime that has a punishment that is so severe because we all are rendered evil by our actions. And it is because of what Jesus did, because Yeshua went to die for your sins, die in your place. He paid the fine for you before the judge. He has therefore allowed you to be righteous, that even though he never made a mistake, he now, because he died for you, he allows you to be seen in light of that you never made a mistake. And that is what saves you. Right, brothers and sisters. So I hope that this is helping you. Uh, you know, this is what I want to read to you. James 2 verse 10. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails on one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law nonetheless. And then lastly, I would read this last part of what this atheist wrote. And he said, and finally... A reality of God alone is perfect. But the problem is, is that a reality with God and sin in this world is less than perfect. There is no reason why God would ever create sin in the first place. Okay, so this is a good question. You know, well, if if God is so as perfect, PD, as you say, then why did God allow sin or evil 
to be in this world? Why does God allow bad things to happen to innocent people? So there's two aspects of this. First off, God, when he created mankind, he put something special in us. Something called free will. The fact that you can choose, the fact that you are conscious and you can sit down and decide about what you're about to do, that you can decide that I'm going to do good or you can decide I'm going to do evil. See, if you would were never created with that ability to decide what is good and what is evil, then you would be basically a pre-programmed robot who will always choose good. And that may be interesting to the ear, but the problem is, is that a if you aren't able to choose, you're not able to love because a love by definition is a choice. And God wanted to create children who would be able to love him and who would consequently be able to choose to love him and choose to do good. If everyone does good by nature, and it's impossible for them to do evil, then there is no choice and there is nothing that is powerful or loving about that. If I had a spouse and she loved me because she had no other choice, that would be strange. But God loved us so much that he gave us the ability to love and choose to love or choose to not love. So therefore, we can choose now to not love our neighbor. See, that's one of the greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself, which is do good to them. That's that's what God wants. That means God's desire is not for evil to be in this world. His number one commandment to us is love. Do not do evil, in fact. And so, but there are people who do not obey God, who who break free and say, I don't want to do, I, I want to rebel. And they don't want to love and they therefore choose to do evil. And so then when they do not love other people, what happens is evil comes upon them and they do evil. They hurt others. They, they, they cause others to have pain inflicted to them. People even die. People get shot. People get murdered. People get things stolen from them. People get abused, whatever it is. Because people choose to do it, evil is in this world. Not because God did evil, but because people do evil because of the loving choice that's been given to them. And then, of course, number two, we live in a world that has fallen when we fell. When we chose evil, when mankind chose chose evil, the entire creation that was created that we were supposed to rule over and look after, that we were supposed to influence by our love and good choices, everything in this world has fallen with us. Nature itself is suffering for the evil of mankind. And so in this world where death has now entered and death surround us everywhere, We now live in a world where death is inevitable and completely possible all the time. So there's a lot of hurt. There's disease. There's sickness. There is there is there are accidents. People die. And and all of this is evil. It's horrible. But again, God did not initially create creation that way. We gave us the gift of free will. And when we fell because we rebelled to rather choose evil, then now creation followed that rebellion because we were supposed to be ruling over nature and looking after it. See, in the garden, when Adam and Eve was there, there were no car accidents. There was no drunkenness. There was no abuse. There was no murder. Those things came in after the fall. So you want a God that is perfect and you want to worship a God in an environment where there is no sin. Well, you just described what the coming kingdom is. 
You just describe where he is saving us to, where the destination is for those who are going to be receiving those white robes, who are cleansed. But the fact is that you keep making mistakes, you keep sinning, you keep doing evil, and you're not going to be welcome in that kingdom. You're not going to be able to be there because you keep doing the things that have caused this world to be in the state it is in now. But there is a way out. And that is what Jesus came to do, is give you a way out. He's given you a new chance. He's come and he has told you, I have come and taken all of your sins upon me, even though I never did a thing. And I have died so that you can be seen the way that my father sees me clean so that you one day can enter that kingdom, that house my father has prepared for you. But recognize that what is happening in this world is not Jesus or his father's fault. It is ours. And all that he has ever hoped to do and is doing now is bringing us to a place that is like the place that our heart desires, that you know that your heart is crying out to a place that is free from death itself. So if that's you, if you want to rededicate your life to him, to give it all up again, all over again, or if you've never heard about this before and you want to follow him, then there's a step that you can take now, and that's just to to speak with me to God and ask him to save you. God, I ask, Lord, that you would come to every person listening to this right now, that you would come and deliver them from their sins, their evils, that you would cleanse them. Father, we repent from what we have done, where we have rebelled, where we have done evil in this world, or we turn from that this day and we want to worship you. We want to follow your kingdom. We want to follow you into the gates of the new coming kingdom, the place where there is no death, where there is no fear, where there is no evil. Father, I pray that you would help us to become the people that you always intended for us to be. Help us to be a light to the world. Jesus, I thank you for saving us. And I pray for everyone who is watching this, that you would save them from their sins. In the name of Yeshua, I mean, if you've watched this and you have decided to follow him, please find a church, a pastor, or even write into us because this is the beginning of a new journey. Thank you for joining me. If you like this video, like it, subscribe to this channel for more like this one. And thank you to our partners who have made this teaching and every other teaching this month possible. Many blessings and shalom to you.